reading is taken from John chapter 14, verse 1 to 6. I will read John chapter 14, verse 1 to 6. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to your word. We commit to each into your hand as he is bringing your word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John chapter 14, verse 1 to 6. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If we've not met before, my name's Rich. I'm the vicar of the church here. And just to echo uh, what Helen said earlier, we had hoped earlier in the week just to have a small handful in the building, those particularly isolated or those who are digitally poor or who find online church a real um, struggle. But as the week went on and things escalated, it seemed sensible to tighten things up further. I realise not everyone will agree with uh, the step we've taken but thank you so much for your understanding and patience. We will, of course, review things as we go uh, week by by week. Now, uh, do keep the uh, other Bibles open. And if last week we thought about this topic of identity through the lens of achievements, am I only as good as my achievements? Uh, This week I want to kind of change the lens, if you like, to that of community and loneliness. Why is it? that lockdown just feels so painful and unnatural. Why is it that all of us at the moment would gladly exchange an emoji hug for a real one? Why is it that even though we are more connected than ever, and and let's face it, isn't it amazing that over Christmas we could Zoom people all over the world, why is it that even though we are more connected than ever, um, the, uh, it has been said that loneliness in the UK has reached epidemic proportions. Why is it that a longing for true community is just such a huge part of my, of my human identity? I thought we'd start with a quick uh, pop quiz uh, this morning. Maybe you want to play along at, um, at home. Here's the, uh, here's the first question, folks. Um, does anyone want to guess how many adults in the UK, sort of um, 16 upwards, how many adults in the UK might describe themselves as feeling alone always or often. Okay, so they've done a survey, adults 16 and up, how many as a percentage do you think would describe themselves as either feeling lonely always or often? Maybe just uh, turn to the person next to you if you're watching with someone, what do we think in the building? Percentages, do you know 20% is the answer? 20%, that's 10 million, 10 million adults folks in the UK who would say I feel isolated, I feel uh, disconnected, either always or often. Um, next question. Apparently, the, uh, the average 18 to 35 year old on Facebook has got 150 friends on Facebook, but when asked how many of those friends could you rely on in a crisis, um, any idea what the average answer was? Okay, so 18 to 35 year olds, 150 friends on Facebook, how many could they say I'd rely on in a crisis? Um, what do you reckon, folks? <laughs> Will's going with six. Um, Do you know, the answer was two. Two, and even more heartbreaking, a quarter of people said one, and an eighth of people said no one. Okay, I've got 150 friends on Facebook. Actually, I couldn't rely on any of them in the events of a crisis. 
And no wonder loneliness has been described as one of the great public health challenges of our time. No wonder Mother Teresa, who obviously uh, famously worked with destitute people in Calcutta, described the worst disease of our time, not as um, leprosy or as um, AIDS or even cancer, but you can see the quote there on the screen, uh, loneliness. I am conscious as I speak this morning. There'll be many for whom this is a really painful issue. There are people in our church family who spent Christmas Day all on their own this year. Uh, I know of many people actually who would say, I've got lots of friends and yet I still feel lonely. Um, There will be people who feel a real sense of a lack of close personal relationship. Can I, can I put this out there? What do you reckon at home? Let me put this out there. Is it possible to be a human being and actually not to feel lonely at certain times and to varying degrees in our lives? Has the Christian faith got anything to say about this subject of loneliness? Why is it that community is just such a big part of my identity as a human being? Well, what I want to do this morning, and uh, we're going to make this as visual as possible and as interactive as possible, because I know there are families kind of watching from home. It's not an all-age service, but we'll try and make it as visual as possible. What I want to do is explore this theme of loneliness through the overall storyline of the Bible, and then the last couple of minutes, maybe draw out one or two implications for life in lockdown together. Be helpful to have a service sheet in front of you. A couple of points. Point one, a self-creating identity. Okay, so all the things that we thought about last week, a self-creating identity, an identity I build for myself apart from Christ, always erodes community. Now, the starting point for everything is the verse that you'll see there on the screen. It's a verse that highlights the uh, plurality of God. Not let me make humankind in my image, but let us make humankind in our image. And the big implication really of that is that we are not just creatures, we are persons. And the whole point of persons is that we are defined in terms of our relationships together. Can you see the point? We are hardwired to be known and to be loved. Not made in the image of a solitary being, but made in the image of a God who is three persons in perfect relationship. And I think, don't we, instinctively, we know this to be true, don't we? So why is it that one of my worst sporting experiences was um, kind of shooting a hole in one and there was no one there to watch it happening? You know, I don't play golf very often, but on this occasion, a brilliant shot. But no one saw it. I think we'll all agree that shared experiences are so much better, aren't they? And just by the by, I think that explains why solitary confinement is one of the worst experiences that it's possible to have as a human being. Because it gets right down to this heart of what it means to be a human being. Relationship. There's something about community that's just intrinsic to our humanness. Uh, the idea, you know, Hugh Grant's every man as his islands, pull up the drawbridge, my islands Ibiza, that is not an idea that you will find um, anywhere in the Bible. Uh, maybe you've seen the film um, Up in the Air, George Clooney, he's a kind of high-powered sort of uh, finance guy and spends most of his time, in, in his words, the uh, happy solitude of travel. Um, exclusive airlines, reward lounges, very casual attitude to relationships and to friendships. He even does a bit of motivation motivational speaking on the side where he commends his way of life to other people the less relational baggage you have the further you will get on in life that is the kind of slogan really of the film yet as the plot develops it all begins to strike quite a hollow note and actually we just become aware increasingly of what he's missing out on because it's not how we are made If we seek identity apart from community and apart from relationship, ultimately that's dehumanising. 
And that is what makes the next uh, bit of the, uh, the story on the, uh, the Bible timeline so tragic. The next thing that happens, remember Genesis 3, in the name of freedom, we go it alone, we seek identity apart from God. In the name of freedom, we push God out to the side. The world is plunged into ruin. And a really big part of that is in terms of our relationships and friendships. So take, for example, the uh, the verse now coming up on the screen, the friendship experience of Jesus. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared bread, has turned against me. And that was Jesus' experience of friendship. As he goes to the cross, denied, betrayed, abandoned. Do you know, Jesus' experience of relationship and community in this world was just to be let down. And you might say that from this point on, the storyline of the Bible is that of sin, broken community. And of course, there are loads of places we could go to kind of illustrate and apply this. But the thing I really want us to get this morning, and this is the time to fasten your seatbelts, is how all of this ties into what we were saying last week. Because with Genesis 3 now on the table, I think it's possible to take last week one step further. It's not just that an identity built on body image, fashion, career achievement. It's not that a self-creating identity is bad for me as a person. And it's not just that a self-creating identity is fragile and enslaving. But what I want to suggest is that now more than that, when we seek to place our identity on these things, it's not just bad for me, but it also erodes community and it will always cause relationships to decline. So uh, take the sitcom Friends. I think, um, I think one of the things that makes Friends such an attractive thing and part of the success of the programme is that it depicts a community that we all want to be part of, right? We all want a group of mates that feel like family. Uh, we all want to be known and to know in return. But the only way that kind of community is possible is if we're willing to be open and transparent and real and vulnerable with people. And that's the problem. Because that is the exact opposite of me trying to create my own identity and present a certain persona to the world. So when things are going really well for me, can we meet up, please? Because I want you to know about my successes and I want my achievements to be broadcast. But when things are going not so well for me, actually, should we not bother meeting up? Because I don't want my achievements uh, to be tainted. And I don't want my failures to be broadcast um, around the place. Can you see what we're saying? We want community. That's how we're hardwired. But we want community on our own terms. We want connection. But we want connection that um, bolsters my self-made identities rather than destroys them. And it's a dynamic you just see everywhere in our world and in our lives. It's why we create technology that gives the appearance of companionship but without the demands of friendship. It's why when I have a rubbish holiday, you can guarantee that the one photo that I'll post online is the photo of uh, me having a really good time. It's why I present myself to the world as being sorted, but actually on the inside I'm quite frustrated. It's why I can be lonely and still afraid of intimacy all at the same time. It's why I long for community, but actually I find community a bit threatening as well, and I want to keep, keep community at arm's length. It's why I love social media because it enables connection whilst at the same time being able to put out a persona out there based on these identities I create for myself. It's why I want friendship, but I want friendship on my terms without taking any risks. I don't want to be vulnerable. It's why the building identity and meaning apart from Christ will always erode community. And it will always leave me isolated and disconnected. If only there was a way of relating together that wasn't tied to our successes and failures. If only there was a way of relating together that wasn't based on performance. 
if only there was an identity that was based on forgiveness rather than achievement because I think we'd have to agree that would be an identity that would transform community and that would be an identity that really would have something to say about my loneliness problems and that takes us to point two point two an identity in Christ that transforms community because as we move along the, the Bible storyline, and we'll have the next part up here, it turns out that there is one person who has experienced lockdown and isolation to the greatest possible extent. It turns out that there is one person who can meet all of our loneliness needs. It turns out that there is one person who will never leave us in our loneliness. So imagine, um, imagine on this piece of paper, imagine on this piece of paper I wrote down all of my deepest, darkest secrets. And I'd never give that bit of paper to you because that would be too much of a risk, right? That would be to make myself far too vulnerable and open and real. But imagine now I gave this bit of paper to Jesus. Um, here he comes. Imagine I give this bit of paper to Jesus. And the amazing thing is that when Jesus reads the bit of paper... He doesn't reject me, and that's not because he doesn't take my moral failure seriously. That's not because, you know, there are no consequences for my my moral failures. But it's because he lays down his life, and he takes my punishment for me. He bears them himself. And as he rises to to new life, he gives me a new identity. And can you see, it's an identity that's not based on performance, but on forgiveness. And it's an identity that's not based on the persona that I put out there to the world, only as good as my achievements. But it's um, an identity that's based on who I really am. And it's an identity that transforms community... Because I can now take the risk of being open and vulnerable and real with people. Because even if you reject me, I know that God never will. Um, I was listening to a podcast um, last week called The Pastor's Heart. Dominic Steele was talking about um, a a friend of his in his Bible study group. And um, a colleague at work had asked her out for a coffee. So a non-Christian friend, can we go for a coffee? And during the course of the conversation, this sort of colleague just shares all of these deepest, darkest secrets about her life. And shares all the issues that are going on in her life. And at the end of the conversation, Dominic's friend in his Bible study group says, Can I ask, why are you sharing? sharing these things with me to which this non-christian lady replied well i don't hear you going around the office sort of talking about people gossiping and so i just assumed that this was a safe place to be real and to talk about what's really going on in my life can you see what we're saying at the cross we're more deeply known than we feel comfortable with but at the same time, more loved than we could ever hope for. And so the cross means I don't have to pretend anymore. And the cross says, well, I can now give myself to others in community. And therefore, the cross says that loneliness never has to have the last words. The cross transforms community. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean that if we accept Jesus, we'll never be lonely. Because we're not home yet doesn't mean that we will never be disappointed by Christian community because it's a community that's based on forgiven sinners rather than perfect people, perfect saints but it does mean that as we come to Jesus his community becomes my community and his relationship with his father becomes my relationship with the father all of which as we finish means that the end of loneliness and the way out of loneliness this morning is not the end of lockdown. We will still be lonely at the end of lockdown. It is possible to have lots of friends and still be lonely. The way out of loneliness is not the end of lockdown. But the way out of loneliness is to find our identity in the loneliest person who ever lived. So I don't know if you've ever had that experience of just looking back sort of 
nostalgically to a certain time or a certain place where you once lived and uh, you sort of hark back to that place nostalgically in your mind. I guess for me personally that place is Edinburgh, that's where I, I lived for a few years when we uh, first uh, left work and I, I mean Claire will roll her eyes this morning but I often sort of hark back to Edinburgh. If only we could be in Edinburgh, then I'd never feel lonely, then I'd be at home, then I'd feel complete, then I'd feel fulfilled. We all have a place or a time in our lives that we hark back to, I think. And what the Bible is saying is that those those kind of feelings of nostalgia, they echo a much bigger longing for something that's bigger than Edinburgh and something that really is out of this world. He's the one we want to be with. He's the one we want to please. And all of our life is focused on that next stop, that last stop on the Bible timeline. When the best friend returns and we get to go and be with him. And so without wishing uh, this morning to be glib or insensitive in any way, could it be that loneliness isn't necessarily a bad thing? Could it be that our loneliness actually makes us realise that something's missing, we're waiting for something else? Could it be that without loneliness we'd never long for home? Could it be that without loneliness we would never seek the Lord? He did loneliness for us and he gives us himself when no person, place, circumstance could ever do that for us. And he says, I will come back and I will take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Uh, Try to create your own identity, only as good as my achievements, body image, fashion, achievement, success. Try and build your own identity and meaning. It will always erode community. It will always lead to isolation and disconnection. But if we find out our identity in Christ, it will transform our experience of loneliness and it will transform our experience of community.